Today's video will be completely different. We're gonna break down gameplay at three different levels using clips from the community, starting at 1400 rating and going all the way up to legend level ratings. It won't be me walking you through the gameplay because, well, <clears throat> I'm just Dan, the guy reading the script. Instead, we've invited BlizzCon champion Joe Fernandez to do a series of VOD reviews for us, where he will show you how to avoid key mistakes the Warriors are making at Challenger, Rival, and even Elite level ratings. If this is the sort of content you'd like to see in the future, let us know in the comments below while we beta test a new review system. We have a vast network of pro players who are ready to review gameplay from the community, so be sure to tell us what class you would like to see next and what we can change to give you the best reviews possible. Anyway, let's let Joe take it from here. Hello there everyone, my name is Joe Fernandez, I'm a previous BlizzCon champion, multi rank 1 player. I uh, do a lot of solo shuffle in my time as well, so we'll be going over a VOD review of an Arms Warrior at around 1400 solo shuffle rating. Um, basically going over uh, seeing the fundamentals, you know, of a warrior, like how to do damage, so be looking at tips of how to improve on dealing your damage properly, especially using offensive cooldowns and dealing with many cleaves, so, you know, um, two target cleave pressure. As well as, you know, kind of the main strategies like um, right target choicing and just peeling at the right time. Because I think in this matchup, Warrior Lock Priest uh, against a Sub Rogue Windwalker, I think a Warrior could do kind of excellent in this matchup. You could kind of be the carry in this matchup because, in my opinion, I think Arms Warriors are excellent into Sub Rogues. You could just peel them on their offensive setups, shut them down many times. And then again, because it's a melee cleave with two melee that are relatively squishy against Warrior. You can just deal a lot of pressure here, like just completely destroy either of them. Basically just pressure both of them and just kill whichever one lacks the defensive. So that's how I would play this matchup really, just kind of going between the Rogue and the Windwalker and just um, yeah, slaying them, making sure that I have a lot of pressure on them and just kill whichever one is the most vulnerable depending on their defensive cooldowns. So right off the bat, I would like to see a different opener for my warrior. Like because we're against a rogue, especially a sub rogue, they can kind of have deadly openers. So if you run into the middle of this map, like on the bridge, you know, on the ramp, and get in combat with a monk straight away, that would be a much better opener. It just to try and deny any sap shenanigans. Um, and then if your priest gets sapped, you can look to try and blade storm or wall banner the opener. Um, I don't think he's playing with wall banner here. Um, which I would recommend. I think War Banner, Disarm, Sharpen would be excellent PvP talents into any sub rogue team, basically, because War Banner can disrupt their setups heavily if you just use it when they're trying to get CC. So here we could get in combat. Again, we're just kind of waiting back. So the Warlock actually gets sapped and they end up opening on Priest, but they get a double fear here. So again, we've already kind of used Sweep and Strikes early on. Now, obviously Sweep and Strikes is going to be key into melee cleaves, but you want to just try and wait a bit until they're actually enraged, because obviously here you're not going to get any use out of Sweep and Strikes um, since the rogue is too far. So only use it as soon as they kind of gather together. Um, sometimes you can min-max use it, say you're in a disarm, and then you can use Sweep and Strikes just before disarm ends, but in this situation, try and hold on to it a little bit just so you can use it to get in range. So going on the Windwalker, the Windwalker's already used Karma, so instantly the Windwalker should be like a very good target um, after this Karma ends, because obviously this touch of Karma was completely wasted, so... And Windwalkers are actually very squishy, unless they kite really well. So it's kind of a win-win situation for you to kill the Windwalker, in my opinion, or pressure him after this, because they'll either have to kite away which means, you know, you can just hit the rogue instead and then relieve your team of pressure. Or if they don't kite away and don't have defensive corners, then you should be able to kill them um, if you do a lot of damage or have CC on the, the priest. Uh, I would say this is also a, a good intervene at the start of the game, intervening your priest when they're taking heavy fire. Uh, so it looks like the enemy team are kind of going on your priest here. So the rule of thumb for me when melee cleaves are kind of um, going on my healer and when both of them are good kill targets, it's just to... Try and hit the one that's like more on your healer. Like say if one goes back, then you can look to hit. Just make sure that like, you can try and get them off your healer essentially. So just pressure the one that's kind of in the most, if that makes sense. And so now getting our end up against the pressure over on the Windwalker. Here this Sharpen is uh, not that good and I'll explain why. 
So obviously we use Sharpen here early, um, getting pressure over onto the Windwalker as soon as thing ends. But the problem with Sharpen here, as you can see, I mean, he's full health, so Sharpen's not going to do anything, right? But I know Sharpen can increase your Mortal Strike damage, but Sharpen, you should treat Sharpen Blade as a CC for the enemy healer, that they because they simply can't heal it. It's a 50% reduction in healing, which is just massive. So if you use this when the when your target is on low health, then it'll be much more difficult for the MET healer to heal. And they'll probably have to use defensive cooldowns or kite you during the time in order to survive. Um, so yeah, those are the two main rules for using Sharper Blade. You either use it when they're low on health, so the healer's going to struggle healing. Or you can use it with your Colossus Smash windows, you know, your offensive cooldowns by yourself. Because then obviously you're going to build a lot of pressure. And that'll be difficult for the enemy team to deal with. Because um, they wouldn't be able to heal it either. So yeah. Um, the shark was like in general you should try and use Colossus Smash early um, and then now also you used a fear on the priest um, Which I don't think is that good just because again we talked about the rogue uh, Windwalker they can kind of win in offensive setups with their offensive cooldowns and in, in stun opportunities So the reason why I don't like the fear on the priest is that it's an offensive fear for when you're trying to kill the DPS But they're high on HP they have the evasion they have you know, even though he doesn't have touch of calm He still has his fortifying brew his damp and harm um, so yeah, they're gonna be relatively fine for now because of this fear, like, because they're high on HP. Instead as well, your priest is just kind of getting railed by a rogue and a Windwalker, right? So I would much prefer defensive fears here, um, especially since it's about to run out the rogue. The rogue has no trinket, the monk's playing human, so if you fear the DPS during an offensive setup, you can actually just counter an offensive setup by yourself because none of them can get out of fear and... You could literally just save your priest's life, save his defensive cooldown usage with a defensive fear. So I don't like the offensive fear here. You should only use an offensive fear when you can get when they're pretty much dead. Like if you know I can fear the priest and kill the DPS, then sure, go for it. But in this situation, we know that's never going to happen because they're high health. They have defensives to deal with you. So most of the time you should use your fear defensively, especially on melee cleave where... You know, they're, they're vulnerable to fear, and it's easy to get multi-target you know multi -target fears, right? Because it's too melee next to you, so it would be easier to peel them. The priest actually gets dangerously low there, so... Um, as you can see, they're just kind of having your way, their way with the Dis Priest, doing a lot of damage. I like that the Disarm's being used for the rogues, this is good. Like, Disarm and a rogue during Shadow Dance is the best use for Disarm, so... It's good that you're using your Disarms and Intervenes, like... I honestly didn't really expect it at 1400 because I see even players at, you know, 2000, 2500 not using Disarm or Intervene sometimes, so it's actually good to see that. However, we kind of get sidetracked here going on the Priest, um, and we even follow him as well. So I would say this was the big kind of fundamental strategy change up because even though the Priest is getting low, you, know, you could maybe finish them off here, but... They're going to have a lot of instant healing. You're playing with a caster, so it's literally just your damage. Um, so unless you can solo them, like, in this short time, it's not going to be worth because obviously you're melee. You're just leaving the melee, tunneling your Dis Priest uh, freely. You would also gain more pressure hitting the melee here because you could have, again, Sweeping Strikes, Colossus Smash um, windows, which are going to be much more effective to create pressure. So not only, yeah, big fundamental strategy, like going on a Dis Priest win, you should be going on the melee. I also don't think I've seen you use a Colossus Smash yet, and we should have maybe used one or it, we should have at least had one usage if not two usages now which would have created you much more pressure so you really want to be using your colossus smash much earlier and now again stormbot and the priest but swapping off the targets i feel like this was a, a big mistake as well cc'ing the priest like you use your fear and your stormbot on the priest but it's not really achieved too much like you got the priest a bit low um i mean the monks use their wall now but kind of just thrown it um, I would have much preferred you use a CC on the melee because, again, you're playing a composition that kind of needs to survive the melee cleave since you have a caster on your team and, and it's your Dis Priest getting tunneled by two melee, right? It's not like you can outcleave them if you and the Warlock go on the disc, so it's like up to you and your teammates to survive. So if you use the Stormbolt on the Monk here or the Rogue, it would have been much nicer to peel off their pressure and create pressure on them as well. We also have Sharpen Up, but now we use Colossus Smash. We get a Skullbreaker beautiful so i like the um uh, we actually force 
Okay, so this was actually a good swing of momentum in your favor. Um, you actually used Skull Splitter well, so you did Ren into Skull into Colossal Smash into Skull Splitter, so it did a lot of damage. You also had Sharpen up as well. I would prefer to use Sharpen straight after Skull Splitter, but it worked out fine for you anyway, because you forced Pain Suppression on the Rogue, and then you used Vanish as well. So those are two big defensive cooldowns. At this point, you could still look to try and kill the Windwalker, because he has no wall and no Karma for a little bit, I believe. Maybe he has Karma back now, but... Either way, this was good, and yeah, this is just because you use your Colossus Smash, so again, it is good. it was good how you use it, but you should have just used this way earlier. Like, you, we went a whole minute in the game where you didn't use a Colossus Smash. Remember, you used Avatar and Bladestorm and Raw, like, you used all the others but Colossus Smash before, and remember, Colossus Smash is actually your biggest offensive cooldown. Even though it's the shortest one, it's your, your most powerful, because Avatar gives you 20% damage increase, Bladestorm doesn't really do too much damage outside of sweeping strikes, you know, unhinged. And again, only when there's Colossus Smash up anyway. Colossus Smash brings you 30% increase in damage. So that's actually 50% stronger than Avatar. Um, so yeah, try and use Colossus Smash a lot more, especially with sweeping strikes in this instance, or, you know, even just playing with Warbreaker into melee cleaves. That would be fantastic for you to get good pressure into these melees and just look to cleave them down. Or a bit of a mistake running into the Ring of Peace here as well. Then obviously we get knocked. The priest does it. See, this is what your fear could have done. We we get to see it here with the the disc priest where just fearing the DPS when he needs to live. So if you did a fear like this, it would have been perfect. Now you disarm the rogue. The disarm on the rogue came a bit too late, obviously because we got ring of peace off. If you could have got the disarm early on the rogue when he used dance, then the priest could have maybe saved void shift here. Um, but obviously it's better to use it than not use it. I like to see that. You're actually using your defenses, like you're using Disarm, you're using Intervene, but the main problem right now is just lack of damage. Um, also not going on the right target, like being on the Disc Priest instead of the melee, which has kind of made this game much more difficult than it needed to be. So now we're, we get Disarm ourselves, we're looking to go on the Rogue. So here, obviously... Double leg sweep can kind of happen, but if you know that they have leg sweep, you could look to try and run out of it, force the leg sweep, and then go on the disc priest. However, this wasn't too bad because the disc priest was on DR anyway, so it wasn't too bad. But again, if we had more defenses for the team, like a defensive storm bolts, defensive fears, and even a wall banner for the stuns, then it could help your priest to live with much more ease, as well as, you know, getting some damage. Like now we have sweeping strikes. I do again like the intervene. You intervene the priest when he's low on health, so. I think this is a good intervene again, um, looking to save him. But now's the time when you really want to pressure these melees, so in my opinion you should have had a sweeping strikes here. Again, you're using Dragon Roar without Colossus Smash. Just remember, Colossus Smash is your most important offensive cooldown. Like, this will increase all of your damage, so it will increase the damage of your Dragon's Roar dot, it will increase the damage of your Mortal Strike, of your dots, of your, sh you know, of everything, so... Always, if you want to use Dragon's Roar, you should ideally have Colossus Smash up anyway. Um, and yeah, play play Warbreaker against Double Melee, or you could use Sweep and Strikes with Colossus Smash here to just slay them both, and you'll do much more damage. So I like that you get the Colossus Smash off. Unfortunately, I think you Skull Splitter here without Rend. Um, let me just see. It's hard to see, but yeah, I think your Rend drops off here, and then... You Colossus Smash into Skull Slayer, yeah, so again, try not to get baited into that mistake. Um, you did a perfect one before with Skull Slayer, where you rend before, and then Colossus Smash into Skull Slayer. But now we're getting good pressure on the road, Colossus Smash is up, as you can see, getting him low, but your Disc Priest dies at the same time, so this actually came down to the wire, which is crazy, considering that there was a lot that you could work on, um, mainly, again, just with... Um, target selection and using your offensive cooldowns well right like i feel like it took us more than a whole minute to use colossus smash in where we could have used it much more and then forced defensive cooldowns even earlier as well as wasting time hitting the disc priest um obviously you drop them low but you could have just spent that time killing the rogue or killing the windwalker monk instead and i think you would have easily won this game so that would be my take back just try and improve on dealing your damage uh well trying to min-max it a bit more when against two melee so you can deal great two target pressure you know using colossus smash more mainly for my opinion i feel like you were using the other cooldowns um but it was just because you weren't using colossus smash much 
uh, perfecting the skill splitter. You did one good example with it and then followed into one mistake where you didn't keep up rent. Um, but yeah, I mean, it was good that you used your defensive tools. Usually I don't see at this rate, and so props to you for actually using them because I swear I sometimes you never see them. But that's the thing, the key thing that you're missing, which is the difference, I would say, between a lot of like kind of the 2k warriors is the fact that they know how to do their damage a bit more. Like they can pump a lot more damage. So I would suggest working on that, dealing great, uh, great multi-target damage, sorry, on two targets, especially against melee cleaves. Um, and yeah, being on the right target, basically, like, instead of, you know, going on a Disc Priest when you should be on the Melee Cleave. This is gonna be of a 2k rated warrior in a Solar Shuffle, just going over, you know, important parts of the matchup, uh, kind of mistakes, you know, to look to improve that could change, you know, the outcome of the game, and also the stuff that they do good to see, you know, things that are going well for them that they could keep up with, and so, you know, they know what they're doing well, and also just look to, you know, focus on any mistakes. So obviously here we have Warrior Luck Shaman against Rep, Paladin, Moonkin Shaman. I would say this is a pretty good matchup for you, uh, for the Warriors team, because the main thing is you have a lot of damage, but you also have more strikes. So I feel like you should be able to overwhelm them more than you, provided that you can kind of just um, reduce their cooldowns. Obviously they have the Avenging Graph for the Paladin and the Moonkin's Incarnation or even Root Beam setups. So pretty much every minute you need to kind of deal with those well defensively but you have the tools for doing it you know especially as a warrior um to live those kind of cooldowns live that well them well with your team and then you should be pretty good in this matchup um and again i think for me personally i would probably go on the moonkin um as soon as he's out obviously going on the rep paladin at the start of the game is fine but my target choice would pretty much be the Moonkin, swapping between them and the Rep Paladin. Basically, looking at the Rep Paladin's position because they're probably going to go on your Warlock. If the Rep Paladin's pushed in far and the Moonkin and Shaman are really far back, then you can maybe swap to the Rep Paladin, you know, punish his over-aggression, um, force cooldowns. But other than that, the Moonkin should be the main target because they're going to be a bit squishier. You don't have to go through as many cooldowns. And you can also, you know, stop a lot of casts, you know, being on the Moonkin, stopping Cyclones, you know, and any of their pressure is also going to be a good thing when you're in when you're playing against this class. So at the start I like the you know I actually like the start of the game just getting the hamstring off. I see a lot of warriors kind of make this mistake of not getting hamstring on the, the, their target for whatever reason um, and he also saves his charge. A lot of warriors also use charge. Again charge can be situational but in this situation uh, I like that he holds onto it, opens up with a hamstring uh, which is good in most openers. So now the Moonkin's out and I would look to swap on here and ooh, we, yeah, th this was kind of a, the first big mistake I would say. So obviously it looks like he's keen on going on the Rhett, which is okay. Again, we discussed that I prefer the Moonkin, but the main thing is this fear. Like, fearing a Moonkin is just bad uh, for two reasons this, this fear is bad. Obviously, the first one's obvious that the Shaman, a Shaman can just tremor fear. So if the Shaman, you know, sees this, he can tremor the Moonkin out and then the fear is completely wasted. But... The second reason why I don't like it is because Fear is actually a really good cooldown for Warriors. They can be such a good peeling tool where you could fear, you know, offensive cooldowns like we see now with the, the Rep Paladin. You know, if we used Fear on the Paladin instead to stop him from using wings, then he would only be able to get out of it with Trinket. So if you want to fear DPS targets, you know, defensively, then make sure to do it during their offensive cooldowns or when your team's taking high pressure. This fear was just kind of thrown out. And then obviously, it, when you're ever against a Shaman, then you should always play around Tremor Tome. You should, which means you probably are going to just fear the Shaman in most situations. However, you know, sometimes you may be a pre-Tremor so you can fear DPS. But yeah, this fear, you know, basically should hold on to, you know, you could have feared the Red Paladin instead or just, yeah, in this situation, saved it for the Shaman. I do like this disarm though, so obviously disarming wings is a good trade as well. You know, um, using disarm in this function when as soon as they pop wings, that's the best time to disarm a rep pallet, and I would say you should pretty much do that every hour. Um, but the reason why I pause it here is also because this is the first time we kind of popped all offensive cooldowns. Um, I don't mind. I mean, I feel like popping all of them at this stage is a bit too much because the Rep Paladin's high health. We don't have CC on the rest of Shaman. Um, obviously, you know, could have feared the Shaman and then done this instead. But it's also because it's the start of the game, so they're going to have every defensive cooldown available, right? So, so far, there's the Urban Wall and you know, the Shield of Vengeance being forced. Um, 
and we'll see what else gets forced. He uses Blades Storm now as well, so now it's literally every offensive cooldown, um, and it gets the Paladin's Wall. So you see, this is kind of why I don't like popping everything in the opener, unless, you know, you're, you're basically banking on them to underreact or overreact, which, you know, could be bad for them. But if they trade efficiently, like this team has done here, using the Earthen Wall, Shield of Vengeance, and Divine Protection, I'd say that's kind of a fair trade considering Avatar. You know, Blade, Storm, Roar, all of these are a minute cooldown plus anyway. So you're not really going to get that pressure again. So in openers like this, if you know that the enemy team's going to survive, then you should probably use, you know, try and save like an Avatar or a Blade Storm. Um, try and save one of these offensive cooldowns for the next time you have Colossus Smash to make your next offensive setup a bit more potent. But I do like the rotation was fine, Sharper Blade was fine. Get a pressure on the Rat Paladin, but again, I would like to see more more damage on the Boonkin, especially when they push in like this, um, because, you know, it means that they could get CC on your healer for free or get damage on your partners without, you know, being punished. Um, the other reason why I would have liked to see him swap earlier, we could go back a little bit, because as we can see here, we're just pretty much hitting a Rat Paladin and Earthen Wall as well, right? So if you actually charge the Moonkin at this point over here, the Moonkin's not in the Earthen Wall, so he's going to take more damage, you're going to get more pressure, and you know, you're just literally going to create more pressure and make it harder for the enemy team to deal with. So you know, this is again why I would like to see him go on the Moonkin here. Um, and I don't, but obviously the disarm was fine. Um, could have intervened as well, his partner during the wings, but they live it relatively well. And now should go on the Moonkin. So here's a Route B, which is again one of the scariest moments uh, combined with Incarnation. So even though the Red Paladin's cooldowns have gone now, this is the the Moonkin's time to to shine, to use cooldowns. So here you kind of need to be worried about the Moonkin's pressure. So as you can see, he gets a lot of pressure, drops the warrior low, and then we kind of see like a classic, I mean, I would say this is fairly a good trade using Die by the Sword for the, the incarnation, but the reason why, you know, this was a mistake earlier was because we still had defensive stance in impending victory. I see, I've seen a lot of VOD reviews and I see a lot of warriors make this mistake where they don't play defensive and then during cooldowns they take big heavy burst pressure and then they end up having to use parry, you know, the desperation to s attempt to survive. So, you know, you should pretty much just be watch out for the cooldowns. You see the incarnation, you see the root beam, so here's kind of the time where you want to be looking at going in defensive stance, looking to use impending victory if you needed. I mean, considering Colossus Smash isn't up anyway, and the enemy team, there's no real pressure, there's no CC on the enemy healer, um, but there is on yours, then, you know, there's no need to, like, play too offensive here, so you could just, like, go in D stance, as you can see, take a lot of damage, intervenes, but still doesn't go in defensive stance, and this is why the parry gets used out, so I would have liked to see going into defensive stance, using impending victory first, then maybe needing to trade the parry if they have heavy pressure on you, um, because obviously the reason why this ends up being a, a big deal again now, not only have we traded parry, but the healers ended up using Trinket Spirit Link. And this is a massive momentum swing in the enemy team's favor because now he basically won't have Spirit Link for the Warlock when the next wings come. So, you know, the Warlock might be in a lot of trouble or the next time he gets put into a root beam. So this is actually a huge, like, key moment in the game. Um, so yeah, if the Warrior played more defensive a bit earlier, could have potentially saved the Spirit Link from it happening, then... Oh, it wasn't the Trinket, sorry, just the Spirit Link, but... Yeah, it could have saved the Spirit Link from happening. However, on the flip side, getting a lot of pressure on Moonkin. I mean, you see, instantly swaps to the Moonkin, we get a lot of big defensive cooldowns. He actually forces Bark Skin um, and Prox's Wall. So, this is actually a really good swap. So now, in this situation, I'll, again, I would be... Advise the warrior, okay, now you force the cooldowns in the, the Moonkin, you should just pursue that. Go on the Moonkin and look to pressure them and, and try to kill them while they don't have defensive cooldowns. Going on the Rep Paladin, I mean the Rep Paladin still has Divine Shield. It's going to have Wall and Shield of Vengeance back soon, so the Rep Paladin is going to be, you know, pretty difficult to kill still. Uh, and bear in mind, you're also taking a bunch of extra cleave damage if the Rep Paladin is on the Warlock and you're on him, so you're ki it's kind of giving them extra pressure and losing out on extra pressure yourself. So again, Earthen Wall Totem up here. Swap onto the Moonkin. This is the perfect swap. Like, you know, you see Earthen Wall on the Rep, now you can swap Moonkin. Without Bark Skin as well, he should really stick on the Moonkin, even if he kites back a bit. Another tip is you can leap on the bridge whilst you're falling down if you're quick enough. Um, but yeah, you need to do it mid-air. You can leap up here on the edge, but it can be 
a bit tricky. You need to get the the positioning just right. Leap it up here is fine as well, though. That's pretty good. So now I would pursue the moon can maybe kill a, a healing stream in between. Oh, this wasn't that great either. Um, so I actually we actually landed a full fear here. Sorry, I went back a little bit too far, but the warlock actually landed a full fear here. There was a shear on the hex into a full fear on the shaman. Um, but then you were just hitting him, I guess, because well, the warrior's just hitting him due to just not being able to hit anyone else. But obviously, this is a mistake because getting the fear on him is huge. So you should just be pursuing the moonkin again. No basket on the moonkin, so gonna be a much easier kill target. Now the fear breaks, um, so gonna keep her alive. And the warlock's even doing a lot of damage on the moonkin. Again, could kill totems to make it a bit easier to kill this moonkin as well. Um, but we're getting the pressure, and now the red paladin is also doing. A lot of damage we're getting them we can really low though force out of the bomb so i like this i like the the pressure you're doing you every every time across the smash is popped you are doing good pressure like the the warriors you know at first getting the cooldowns from the rep now again big cooldowns from the moonkin um forcing the bot forcing him in bear form so defensive play as well shaman even uses trinket here as well so maybe he actually does overlap so they overlap tr uh, trinket spherelix so now this is huge momentum swing in your favor because They've overlapped big defensive cooldowns, a bop and the trinket link from the shaman, also ascendant, so kind of forced out everything. You can see how much better this game is going as soon as we swapped our attention onto the moon kid. So yeah, again, there's two healing streams in the face as well, like hitting a moon kid in battle is not going to do much, so you could look to kill these instead, or maybe kill a grounding to help out. The precog getting forced there, and uh, yeah, now we're basically going to be a bit worried again with the fear as well. The double fear on the DPS when a shaman is free, um, yeah, this is and, and nothing's really happening either. So, again, the fears need to be worked on. Could just you could have even waited to fear the shaman a bit later, maybe kill the moonkin, um, or, or you know, wait for barkskin and then fear the shaman after barkskin to kill the moonkin. I think that would have been the better play here again, fearing. DPS is only good if you're going to peel something. So if the rare had wings up, then sure, fearing them would be good. Or if the moon can add ink on up, then fearing them would also be good. So we get knocked down, leaps back up, intervene as well. Good pummel on the raft, pressure in the moon can still. I like this pressure going ham on him as well. Okay, so this disarm, I mean, it is a little bit nicer because the warlock's low, but again, the problem is the wings that's going to inevitably happen. Um, but I, I can see why you would disarm when your warlock's low at this point, so I don't really blame you. But again, try and want to disarm the wings and uh, instead. And now we're still pumping the Moonkin, doing a lot of damage. However, the lock's going to get really pumped now. Also could have maybe prevented this cloning herself with a Storm Bolt on the Moonkin. We get Shadow Fury proc as well, but you can see how close this game is. Like, this game was literally down to the wire. Um, Moonkin on 6k HP left and, and your lock just about dies. Could have used Rally for him as well, so maybe that would have been the difference, but I wouldn't hold that, you know, one global mistake can kind of happen. Uh, wait, let me see if you actually, yeah, you do have the Rally Cry, but the main issue wasn't just for the Rally Cry. Now, obviously, this could have been nice to have, maybe it could have been the difference, but the main difference was came from before when, um, when you didn't parry or go into defensive stance quick enough during the Moonkin's incarnation. So you took a bunch of damage and your healer had to use Spirit Link for you. If if your healer had Spirit Link here for when he actually needed it for the Warlock, then it would have been, you know, it, it would have been a guaranteed win. Like the, the lock would have lived, you would have lived through Spirit Link and then you would have easily killed this Moonkin. Also, if you started on the Moonkin, you might have won earlier, right? I mean, because we kind of wasted all of our beginning offensive cooldowns on the Rep Paladin at the start of the game. And all we got was, you know, Shield of Vengeance, Urban Wall, and Divine Protection, which are all cooldowns that can trade every time you pop all of your offensives. So it's it's not a good trade for you. If you went onto the Moonkin and just forced his cooldowns, then, you know, I mean, they don't have as many potent defensive cooldowns uh, compared to a Rep Paladin. So I would have went on the Moonkin much more, looking to slay them. And yeah. Uh, the, disarm, the first disarm was good though on the wings, and I like the damage in general, just needs to go on the right target and, you know, make better use of fear as well. And I'll be going through a VOD review of a 2900 rated warrior, so, um, you know, quite high up there compared to the average person, and playing TSG into Fury Warrior Rep Paladin, so, 
Here, I would probably just look to go on the warrior mainly, cleave the rep paladin, and kind of just survive there. Big offensive cooldowns, obviously. Fury Warrior has the recklessness avatar pops at the start of the game, and a rep paladin's wings, you know, so surviving them will be really important to stay alive or keep your teammates alive, and then can look for wing conditions later on. So here, obviously, the star game can look to just charge in whenever you feel ready to, um, charging on the warrior, getting onto them, which is fine. Um, here they actually kind of get the classic setup, so the hodge on the warrior with a storm bolt on the shaman. So obviously it's they're kind of going to get it first because you're unable to stun the healer due to nullifying shroud, but try to look to blades on this. Obviously won't be able to always get them. If you can't, then you should ideally be in defensive stance during this time, so you could potentially sit the stun. Obviously, you're not going to sit the stun though if the cooldown's being popped, and as you can see right now, the wings just gets popped, the recklessness gets popped, so you're probably going to need to use trinket parry straight away. Even though it, it's kind of, it feels weird to trinket parry in an opener, in this situation it's more than fine too, because it's actually a good trade for you. So you get the trinket, but ooh, we actually get disarmed on the trinket, and now all of a sudden, the opening trinket kind of gets punished, and they deal a lot of damage, like they, they completely wreck you and the death knight here, so um, yeah, this was a, you just have to be very quick when you're going to parry, like uh, maybe they, the warrior just felt like they could greed out, trinket and then do a pop first, a, a blade storm instead, um, but here they already had CC on your healer, like of the storm, but they already popped their offensive cooldowns, I would just immediately trade it out of the parry and this is going to be quite hard now because obviously they're going to have to use other cooldowns to keep you alive. I will say though, the victory rush did come in clutch there. Like, uh, it's the only reason you're alive right now, to be honest. Like, obviously you should have parried, but the victory rush kept you alive, which is good. But now the healer had to bust out their life-saving cooldown immediately. They had to use Spirit Link immediately, which is not what you want at the start of the game, because obviously it's going to be much harder now to survive their next set of defensive cooldowns if it gets to that point. Um, so yeah, this is like a very good opener from them. Uh, in my opinion, but at least yeah, you got off the victory rush, but this is a, a key mistake You know just trinket parry when you see these cooldowns, you know It's every offensive cooldown by them So trinket parry would be a good trade and then your healer wouldn't need to link you, you could just sit the CC with joy and you know your DK Has IBF up anyway AMS and you could also intervene with parry up to deflect the warriors damage effect some of the rets damage as well um, So yeah, it would be good Okay, this fear was, I mean, you can see we feared them, but you can see I literally pulled, sighed and paused for a second because that's how long the fear lasted, so a fear like this just isn't good. Like, maybe they wanted to do it defensively, but obviously now the Spirit Link's up, it's really not needed. Uh, it's going to break because the DK's pressuring both of them anyway, you're pressuring both of them anyway, so would only do it in desperation attempts to survive if you need to. Otherwise, you could look to just wait for, if you waited 12 seconds for Nullifying Shroud, whilst you're pressuring the warrior, then you could fear the evoker and the ret together. Especially when you're the target, you can just go to the evoker with a charge. Um, if the ret's following you, then you can get a double fear and then pressure the warrior and create your own setup, your own 1v3 in that regard. So now you did your own pop here as well. Um, I like this pop, even though it was without Colossus Smash, you still get a lot of defensive cooldowns here. You get the the wall by the warrior and the vengeance from the rep paladin sacrifice as well so you get quite a lot of defensive cooldowns with this um so yeah you can probably hit the red in sack now after that sack i mean the warrior should be now a good kill target because enraged regeneration this is a one minute cooldown here it's actually you know a, a two minute cooldown in actuality so fury warriors are going to be a very good kill targets now that he won't have wall for pretty much the remainder of the game um, but it's good that you punish the red paladin um, during the sack, like swap it over to them. I kind of like this as a disarm because it's on the crusade. However, again, I feel like uh, as soon as your offensives were over, like as soon as Colossus Smash isn't up and you're not pumping them, as soon as your Spear of Bastion isn't up and you're not pumping them, or you force their big defensives, uh, I mean, you force Dragon Cry as well, then you should be in defensive solace just because they're playing crusade. I mean, I wouldn't say this is a typical talent to deal with but obviously when they have 10 stacks of crusade this is when they're at their most deadly it is a really good disarm though over onto the rep but you should probably just be in defensive stance during this time until you get sustained again and the shaman can kind of keep you topped because right now you're the one taking the pressure 
you're the one getting cleaved heavily. You do a defensive Stormbolt. This intervene was a little bit questionable. I mean, it doesn't matter too much. The only reason why it can kind of matter is because obviously there's just no distance between the Rep Paladin and your, your healer. So before the Rep Paladin only had to hodge you, right? Whereas if you're bringing the Rep close to your healer, then the Rep Paladin can easily hodge your healer, which means more CC on your Shaman and then more trouble for you. So I would say that the intervene was kind of weird. I would have much rather stayed in the position you already were. Just try and max distance, you know, keep the melee away from your Shaman while you're being trained so your Shaman can pretty much cast out heals. You know, he even did a good job getting a Hex, so you could just keep pressuring the melee and try and keep them away from your Shaman. Because, yeah, now, as you can see, gets Hodge, but ends up having to trinket it uh, to keep you sustained. And again, we're getting caught in stun with Battle Stun, so one thing I would recommend is just anytime. They are Stormbolt ready, you should probably be looking to go into defensive stance, right? There's very rare moments they're going to be able to just hodge you, you know? So he's probably just going to hodge the healer instead. Um, as soon as they have Stormbolt ready and you know that they can pump you, or that you're taking quite heavy pressure, then you should probably just go in defensive stance until you get high on health. Once you're high on health, then you can go in battle. You know, if you get Stormbolt in battle stance, but you're 100% HP, and it's not, you know, recklessness and wings, which obviously they don't have right now, then you will you will most likely be fine. There's no way that you will die, you know, unless it's extreme damp. So I feel like we just didn't really utilize defensive stance at all. It felt, it felt like you're in battle stance the entire game so far, and they're kind of heavily punishing it right now. Because not only has it been hard for um, you to live, but it's also been hard for you to do any pressure because you're just kind of on the back foot. So here, taking a lot of damage, and then you end up parrying as well. I would say this parry wasn't great. Um, yeah, this is quite a vile mistake because, I mean, I, I see you're getting low, so I can understand why you're, you're going to use parry. But the problem is, again, I mean, you still have defensive stance to use, right? And you just use victory rush, which again has been good. I feel like your impending victories have been nice. It's just you should try and look to use defensive stance first. The reason why the parry isn't nice is because obviously there's no offensive cooldowns going on, right? Like the wings isn't up for a while. Um, the warrior has already popped all their offensive cooldowns, which was when you probably should have used parry, like at the very opener when you trinketed. So now, now you don't have parry for the next offensive cooldowns, which is going to be very hard for you to live, in my opinion, because, um, I mean, you're taking a lot of damage as it is because we're not in defensive stance enough. And, you know, they're, they're going to have the wings back soon and then... Unless you can kite like a god, it's going to be very difficult to live. Um, so obviously, yeah, the parry comes out. At least you can get aggressive during this time. We get a blade storm, but they bop it. So, you know, you go onto the rare. I like the swapping here. The swapping's good here, actually, because you just instantly swap. You're kind of in maxing damage that way. So it is good. Um, could be hitting the rare a little bit more until bop ends. Um, and yeah, going back onto the warrior once the bop ends. Looking to pressure them. So now we have Earthen Mool up, which is your one. So again, here, it's like, I feel like you're just overstaying your welcome in battle starts. Here, we know he has Stormble back now, and, and you're dropping low once again. Um, so yeah, I would have liked to have been in D starts. Actually, I think you were in D starts. Okay, so you were in D starts here, sorry. Which is because of the... And then you swapped to battle starts here, and then you kind of get a lot of pressure. I mean, yeah. Again, here, I would still go back into d stance straight away, just because you get disarmed, right? If you're disarmed and you can't trinket it, then there's no point in even, you know, going back into battle stance. So, you could just stay in d stance, take a bit less damage, trying to leap away whilst the Shaman's in CC. I mean, it, this was a noble attempt to try and stay alive. We actually end up dying here as well, but, you know, defensive heroic leaps could be good. If you want to, I would suggest you could try and... um heroic leap up on the ledge instead so you see all the way in the left here um if you leap up here i mean obviously in this situation it might have not made too much of a difference but you could just kind of avoid the red paladin right because you could maybe line of sight them the warrior could follow you with a heroic leap but then at least maybe you could live if you avoid the red paladin's damage but again the main issue came from you know earlier when we used our parry so um yeah, that was the main issue. We just used parry when nothing was really happening. There was no CC on our healer. It was just you got Stormbolt low. And the main thing was just stance management. Um, I think utilizing defensive stance more when you're taking pressure and you're not really dealing any will help you live 
much more. I mean, considering you hardly did any damage whilst you were in battle stance anyway, it kind of just shows you the importance of defensive stance. Um, and yeah, if anything, you could have, you should have used parry at the very start of the game, where they popped every single offensive cooldown, landed a hodge on you with Stormbot on the healer. You trinketed the hodge, so that would have been the perfect time to use your parry, um, because you would have negated all that damage, and then your shaman would have definitely had spirit link for you still, like he, because even if they swapped onto the DK, you could the DK had IBF, and you could have intervened them with parry up as well. So you would have been much better with defensive cooldowns in this game. Um, so yeah, just know your trades with defensive cooldowns with your parry. Like, against Fury Warriors, doing it on their pop, as well as a rep pops, like, you could just trade it at 100%, like, I, I would every time. Um, it would be so much easier to live, because the next time the Fury Warrior has their cooldowns again, you'll have parry again, so it makes it much easier to live. And, yeah, again, defensive stance usage, I felt like you were just in battle stance way too much. It, it can be nice, like, if you have momentum on your side, but as you could see from this game, literally since the beginning, the momentum was in their favor the entire game, so needed to try and maintain your HP, like utilize defensive stance more, make sure you can survive what's to come, and then, you know, look for a kill later on. All right, guys, that wraps it up for our very first VOD review. Once again, if you like this video or want to see more VOD reviews, let us know what you liked and what we can do different. If you want to see more reviews from Joe, be sure to check out his arena commentaries over at skillcap.com. There you can see detailed breakdowns of warrior gameplay as he teaches you how to navigate through your toughest matchups. Our website features commentaries and courses for every class in WoW, while teaching you the fundamentals you need to master to climb rating faster than you thought was possible. We're the only service that offers a money-back guarantee if you don't gain at least 400 rating while actively using our website. We do this because our service is proven to work, and if it doesn't, you don't pay. Learn more by clicking the link in the description below. As always, though, we want to thank you all for watching. See you soon.